This is a beautiful specimen of a natural pyramid crystal called benitoite, the only gem of its kind in the world. Benitoite was discovered near the headwaters of the San Benito River in the coast range of California, 40 miles over dry hills from the nearest town, Coalinga. In this sparse country, the earliest known inhabitants were Tachi Indians. In the 1880s, they were driven out by Spanish-Mexican families who wanted the land for stock raising. The first homesteaders arrived in the 1860s. Gustav Krayenhagen opened a general store near the Pozo Chana, an old Indian watering hole. The Akers family chose Las Gatas Creek. And Joseph Valentine Mathis, who had crossed the plains in a covered wagon, settled near the little town of Hernandez. When coal and oil were discovered, the Southern Pacific Railway built three coaling stations to fuel its engines. Coaling Station A became Coalinga. In 1901, Roderick Dallas, a young man from the east, arrived to check on an investment made by an uncle in the New Caledonia Oil Company. Rod came from a strict Scottish Presbyterian family and didn't drink, smoke, or swear. Most of the inhabitants of Coalinga were single males, prospectors and roustabouts, who were frequently found in 13 saloons that lined Front Street, also known as Whiskey Row. It was a rip-roaring frontier town with a reputation for raising nothing but hell and jackrabbits. It wasn't long before Rod leased some land on the west side of town and became a wildcatter looking for oil. An independent operator, he called his company the Lucille and his first derrick, the Lucille No. 1. His crew was about as new to the oil business as he was. They knew how to dig, but that was about all. At 1,000 feet, they struck oil and were soon pumping several hundred barrels a day. Not long afterwards, and not far away, the silver tip gusher came in, producing five and a half million barrels in just four months. Coalinga was growing into a real town. Families moved in and built houses and a school. Church services were held in a railway passenger car on a siding. There was a volunteer fire department and an opera house. Rod began to smoke cigars and learned to play the harmonica. He got a little dog, which he named Boxer, after the rebellion in China. Then he met Lida and Ida, the Mathis twins, from the Pioneer family in San Benito County. Lida taught at a one-room country school in Hernandez. Lida and Rod got to know each other at Fresno Hot Springs, which had been discovered by an uncle of the twins when he shot a grizzly bear there and washed his hands in a bubbly spring of what turned out to be warm sulfur water. He built a bathhouse, which later on Gustav Krayenhagen turned into a resort hotel. People from all over came Saturday nights to dance to tunes from a fiddle and guitar. Rod came by stagecoach from Coalinga and courted Lida, and with other couples played games and took pictures. At the Alpha Clubhouse, a young ladies' organization in nearby Lemur, Rod and Lida were married in 1906. In Coalinga, they built a house at 193 Jefferson Street. Rod organized the Independent Oil Producers Agency to get a pipeline to carry the Independent's oil to the coast, since the little companies couldn't compete with Standard and Associated, which had their own pipelines. Nor could they get space in the Southern Pacific's tank cars. It was about this time that Jim Couch came to the Lucille looking for work, and Rod grubstaked him for $50 to go up the Las Gatas Road to look for cinnabar or copper or whatever he could find. It was December when Jim drove his horse and wagon about 25 miles out, camping that night at the Acres Ranch. When the road petered out, he unhitched the wagon and went on by horseback, stopping in a little valley he described as a beautiful pine-studded glade as level as a floor, where there was a nice stream of water and an abundance of green grass for my faithful horse. 
After making a pot of coffee the next morning, he walked about 75 yards up the hill. And there lay thousands of blue gems weathered out of snow white silica. Rod sent an engineer, Lee Hawkins, to go with Couch on a second trip, and samples were sent to gem experts. First, it was thought to be volcanic glass and of no value. Then the word went out that it was sapphire. But it was Professor George Lauderback of the University of California who identified the gem as a specific crystal structure that has been determined theoretically and proved mathematically in nature, but never been found before. It created great excitement in geological circles. Professor Lauderback named the new gem Benitoite after the county and the river. A companion stone, a shiny black prismatic crystal embedded in the same white matrix, was later identified as Neptunite. Most Benitoites are cornflower blue, but they range from almost colorless to purple-violet. The gems are double refractory, like diamonds, which means they radiate other colors only slightly masked by the blue. Sapphire, which gives off only blue, is less brilliant. The Benitoite is softer than either diamond or sapphire, being only 6.5 on the Mohs scale. Rod Dallas lost no time filing papers of incorporation, and on February 20th, 1907, the Dallas Mining Company became official with an organizational meeting held in Coalinga. Sam Bowen, a friend, put in some money and was elected chairman of the board. Mrs. Dallas, an ex-school teacher who wrote clearly using the Palmer method, became secretary and kept the books. H. H. Welsh, a lawyer from Fresno, came to draw up the papers. 100,000 shares of stock were issued, and to pay operating expenses, 10,000 shares were put on sale at 50 cents each. Jim Couch offered to work for $3 a day, half in shares. Soon, horses and mules, wagons and provisions, geologists and laborers arrived and broke new trails over the hills to the mine site. The hand laborers were paid $1.50 a day, plus grub. None of them knew anything about gem mining. Hundreds of valuable stones were ruined as they blasted, chiseled, and hammered their way through the hard white matrix in which the Benitoite was embedded. At the mine site, beginning in July 1907, a daily record was kept by the miners. The first entry was to the effect that a mining expert from Shreve & Company, San Francisco Jewelers, had visited the mine and pronounced it good. Shreve & Company signed a year's contract with the Dallas Mining Company to buy all the gems that could be mined. There were many visitors to the mine, including Miss Margaret Dallas, Rod's sister, who came from the east. The log records that she went up Sawmill Creek for tea with Mrs. Hawkins, and they had a long discussion on theology. The miners made a cut into the hill. They chopped logs, built a cabin, and dug a toilet. Mr. Couch took a bath in the little creek that ran by the door. He was bitten by a rattlesnake. Nothing serious. The pile of rock that came out of the shaft carried many gems. The miners learned how to extract them by putting the ore into hydrochloric acid to dissolve the matrix. They tunneled far into the hill. One time, Rod Dallas carried a thousand carats of Benitoite to Coalinga in a cigar box. But it took time to turn the gems into money, and by February 1908, the Dallas Mining Company was broke. Carl Baker, a prominent citizen who had made a lot of money designing and selling drilling equipment, came to the rescue and bought 500 shares of stock. And since the market with Shreve seemed a sure thing, the board decided to borrow money from the Coalinga Bank. However, Shreve and Company lost some of its early enthusiasm and wanted to pay less per carat than agreed upon. They were concerned that since the mine was the only one of its kind in the world, how could they maintain a supply if the vein were lost? Another problem was the Benitoite's softness, which made it impractical for engagement rings since they can get pretty hard usage from pots and pans after the romance wears off. The board of directors of the Dallas Mining Company wouldn't budge on the price and voted unanimously that 
No further business shall be transacted with Shreve and Company under the contract made the year before. There were no other prospects, and the Dallas Mining Company was over $3,100 in debt. The board levied five cents a share on all stock. Those who didn't pay were to have their stock put up at public auction. Lida began to paste the return stock certificates back into the book. By June, when the company's debt had risen to $6,300, the assessment was increased to 10 cents a share. Among the stockholders who couldn't pay were Jim Couch and Lee Hawkins. Work went on at the mine, but without the old enthusiasm. It was hard to follow the vein. There was trouble with the miners as well, possibly because some pay was in shares of stock, and what was a share worth? Some of them blamed that fellow in Koalinga whom they now called Righteous Rod, because when he visited the mine on July 4th, a Sunday, they said he observed the holiday in a pious and sanctimonious manner. In contrast, things were going well in Koalinga. From a lookout near the mine could be seen hundreds of oil derricks dotting the landscape. In 1910, the Independent Oil Producers Agency got their pipeline to the coast. Rob bought a big office safe to hold the papers, as well as all the returned shares of mining stock and unsold Benitoites. The Koalinga record reported that 43,228 shares of delinquent stock were to be sold at auction no one bid. At the mine, the Chinese cook, Ah Wing, quit. An entry in the log said that after that, the food was pretty bad. Some of the other men also quit, and others were fired. Another entry, possibly from Mr. Couch, read, I start for Koalinga and take part of my things. I go for good. On a train trip east in 1910, Rod and Lida presented a specimen of Benitoite to the Smithsonian Institution. Koalinga had become a substantial town with some fairly wealthy men, but nobody wanted to invest in Benitoites, even after the price per share went down to 25 cents. The decision was made to close the mine. In May 1912, Honest Rod personally paid off the mining company's bank loan. The other big news of that autumn for Rod and Lida was the birth of a daughter, Helen. Rod proudly passed out cigars. At the final board meeting in Koalinga, Rod Dallas, as president, was instructed to procure a patent for the mining claims from the federal government. On March 26, 1914, the Dallas Mining Company was awarded a land patent in a document signed by Woodrow Wilson as president of the United States. Only occasional visitors went to the mine. Lida's twin, Ida, and her husband, Tim Brothers, went on a camping trip, and on one visit, Rod took his little daughter, Helen. Whether it was on purpose or through neglect, the Dallas Mining Company didn't pay the state franchise taxes, and on March 3, 1917, forfeited its charter and ceased to exist as a corporate entity. These were World War I years. Rod headed the Koalinga Red Cross, and Lida went back to teaching school. Rod also helped organize the Chamber of Commerce and became involved in politics. He earned another nickname, Recall Rod, when he helped oust two county supervisors. As a Hiram Johnson Republican, he supported small-town leadership against the big boys. Among those he singled out for special opposition were the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Bank of America, and William Randolph Hearst. With his good friend F.J. McCollum, the owner and editor of the Koalinga Record, he organized a promotion to make Koalinga the midway metropolis of the San Joaquin Valley. They brought a trainload of bankers and businessmen from Los Angeles, hoping to interest them in investing money and starting enterprises. Many came, but few, if any, stayed. Soon after this, Rod left Koalinga. The Lucille Field was sold in 1925, and the Independent Oil Producers Agency closed in 1926. During the Depression, Rod and Lida moved to Mendota, another valley town. Lida went back to teaching in a two-room country school in nearby Muscle Slough. Rod started another chamber of commerce, 
and installed his roll-top desk with the sign above it that read, Live so you can look any damn man in the face and tell him to go to hell. Uninvited rockhounds visited the mine site in those years. Some came on foot or with mules, and later in cars to take out their findings. One celebrated specimen weighed nearly 200 pounds. Rod and Lida presented their largest specimen to the geology department of the University of California, where it is still on display. At the mine site in 1944, a forest fire swept down into the valley and burned all the trees and the cabin. Man did not spare the mine either, and various lessers bulldozed it away looking for the lost vein. All that was left was a scarred hill. For a long time, the mine was leased to a Mr. Cole, who had no more luck finding the vein than anyone else. After Rod's death in 1950, Lida, then well into her 70s, took a lively interest in the mine, driving up from Mendota every weekend to scare the poachers away. When Mr. Cole got too old, Buzz Gray and Bill Forrest leased the mine, and a few years later purchased it. They couldn't find the vein either, and settled for getting their specimens from the old dump. A locked gate was put across the main road to discourage poachers, but otherwise, today, the landscape looks the same. The little pool where Couch took his bath is still there, and at the forest fire site, trees are growing back against outcroppings of stone. In 1987, Benitoite was made the California State Stone, and more and more rockhounds now want specimens for their collections. Miners still dream of gems as perfect as these. Perhaps one day, someone will finally find the lost vein of Benitoite.